morning, everyone. How are you doing? Doing good. How are you? I'm doing great. Great to see all of you. A um, bit of a shorter crowd today, but that's perfectly fine because the recording will be available online. So everybody will be able to see all the amazing things that they're going to miss at this Lunch and Learn. But thank you all so much for tuning in. So I'll introduce myself. Um, so my name is Shondon Moore. I work for Cobb Waters Communications and Education Division. So we are the ones who actually host all of the Lunch and Learns that go on here. Um, and most of our Lunch and Learns focus on pollution prevention or about water quality or water environmental conservation um, and our role in that. Um, but today we're gonna take a bit of a different focus and really look at kind of why a little bit uh, we care about those things. And specifically we're looking at amphibians today, which is why you're all here. Um, we're going to talk about all of Cobb County's amphibians, how you can maybe find and identify them. I'm going to play some audio calls for the frog specifically, um, and hopefully um, have you all walking out of here remembering some of these species. So you're like, oh, I hear that frog. Or when you come across these salamanders, you can maybe identify them. So pretty, pretty cool. Um, today is the first time that uh, we are self-teching the program. So usually there's always someone behind the scenes, but today, we're going to give it a try with just myself. It'll go perfectly fine, I'm sure. Um, and I can still see the chat box as well, but since there's kind of so few people in here right now, um, at when I have like question and answer time, feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or you could just type them in the chat box and I can answer them at the end. Um, but on that note, um, let's go ahead and uh, get started. So, We're going to start off with a very interesting quote here. Every proud Georgian should be a herper. And I wonder who said this quote. It was actually me last year. Um, because this quote is actually so, so true for a wide variety of reasons. I'm not only passionate about herps, um, herps being amphibians and reptiles, um, but I believe everybody who lives in Georgia and is proud about this state should also be very proud. Um, and I'm going to kind of prove that to you. But we have a ton of really neat species that you can't find in other places of the world. Um, and we break a lot of records with our species as well. So that's kind of how I'm going to start. Here is a heat map of all the, well, of amphibian richness across the world, basically. So the hotter you are, the redder you are, the more you know, species of amphibians you have. Um, and automatically, your eye probably goes straight to uh, <laughs> the Amazon here. Okay, it's hard to beat the Amazon. It's an amazing place, right? But if you're looking at places that aren't deep red, you'll see that the southeast of the US is pretty much on par with many other places around the world, like at least around the top five in terms of amphibian richness. And if you zoom in a little bit closer, you'll see that Georgia is a part of the pocket that has the most amphibian richness, right? Um, so we are kind of individually unique among like this country that we're in. And even if you're looking across the world, um, we're definitely ranked pretty highly. Um, before I continue, I wanna go ahead and give a special thanks to the Amphibian Foundation. Um, I have a lot of knowledge and a lot of training uh, when it comes to herps, amphibians and reptiles, um, but a lot of that experience came from outside of the state. Um, so when you're trying to understand like local amphibian species, it's always nice to have somebody who's an expert. And if you don't know what the Amphibian Foundation is, um, they're an amazing nonprofit based in Metro Atlanta. Um, and they are um, who helped kind of cultivate all this local knowledge about the species you can find. Um, and eventually there'll be a partner um, in our amphibian monitoring program, our volunteer amphibian monitoring program that I'll talk about kind of at the end of this program. So really cool. Also, if you want any information regarding the images I'm using, um, I can provide that to you at the end of the presentation as well, or you can in email me. But let's go ahead and start. So, Georgia's amphibian species. I wanna talk about the records that we have. First, we actually have the largest frog in North America, the American bullfrog, eight inches in length. Um, that is pretty darn long, like almost bigger than many of our hands. <laughs> in some cases, depending on what your hand size is. We also have the smallest frog in North America, the little grass frog, which can actually fit on the tip of a dime. So really, really small. We also have the 
Longus salamander in North America. That's the three-toed Amphiuma. So 3.5 feet in length. It's a really long vivian species. And when you're talking about like length and largeness, you can kind of divide that into like what's long versus what's really heavy. Um, but we kind of got both because we also have the Eastern Hellbender, which is the heaviest salamander in North America, which can weigh up to five pounds, which imagine a salamander weighing five pounds. <laughs> like that's a pretty, pretty large, just to show you an image of that, there is one in uh someone's hand and you know, honestly, if you had picked that up, you probably wouldn't even know that was a salamander you were holding. Um, so really big. And honestly, that might be among the biggest in the world, really. But there's a couple of species that outclass it significantly in um, parts of Asia um, called the cryptobrachid salamanders. I have photos there. Um, and those are kind of unique. There are no other uh, amphibian species that get anywhere near those. So if you ignore those, though, the Eastern Hellbender is probably one of the largest in the world, too. So really neat. We also have cool ecological things, like we have salamanders that are lungless, which, to be fair, that's actually pretty common for salamanders not to have lungs, um, but it's still a really unique trait. We also have, like, our wood frog, for instance, um, that can literally freeze during the winter um, instead of going into, like, a traditional hibernation. They actually have cells that can actually deal with actually freezing, which is really, really cool. So we have a lot of cool things going on here. And my goal, again, is by the end of this presentation to hopefully have you all a lot more knowledgeable about the species that live here. So before we dive into those species, I just want to get our basic amphibian knowledge going on first. Like, what is an amphibian in the grand scheme of life? If you remember maybe from your biology classes, like way back when you were in school, uh, you probably know that amphibians are in the class amphibia. So you probably remember the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, the way that we kind of organize the web of life, right? So amphibians lie in the kingdom animalia. So these are animals within kingdom animalia. They're in the phylum chordata. So these are things that, um, animals specifically, that have a nerve cord or a spinal cord. And within, that group you have class amphibia so pretty much from that point down you are an amphibian right the term amphibian literally means double life like it's latin translation but you probably just know them as frogs toads salamanders and sicilians which is that photo in the top right uh, we don't have any sicilians in the u.s um, but they are kind of their own distinct group among amphibians, but we're not going to be able to talk about them because we're really focusing on our species today. So let's kind of dive into that a bit more, where amphibians lie. So as I said, they're in the phylum chordata. So these are organisms that have a nerve or a spinal cord, right? If we want to see where amphibians lie among chordate animals, um, the most ancestral version of those I have here at the top corner are lancelets and tunicates. They don't have a spinal cord like we do, but they do have um, a nerve cord, um, so kind of a central nerve that uh, controls all of their life functions for the most part, or something similar. And then from there, as far as evolution, as far as what we understand, it got a bit more advanced, right? You develop vertebra. So if you have a nerve cord, that runs all of your life's functions, it's kind of important that you protect that nerve cord uh, for your life. So you eventually develop vertebra. These are hagfish. Hagfish is, our, is a, one of the species that are still currently alive um, that are chordates, um, but they're jawless. And so they have kind of like a cartilage vertebra. And then it got more advanced from there. Um, they develop jaws to be able to exploit more animals to eat. So then you get into the cart cartilagin cartilaginous fish like sharks, and then you get into bony fishes like the clownfish I have here. And then more advanced. Um, by this point, you can kind of see what's happening. So you have tunicates and lan lancelets at the bottom of the ocean. They develop the ability now to swim around and consume different types of prey, and they're working their way up to the top of the water column. And eventually, you get fish that start to develop literal lungs, like the lungfish, which is on the right side here, um, which has lungs. And then this is actually a now extinct species, a fossil called a tiktalic, 
and that's a 3D renderation of, uh, renderation of it based off of its fossil. Um, and based off of its like skeletal structure, they believe that it actually could kind of hobble on land a little bit to exploit lots of different prey. So really, really cool. And then finally, when you make that halfway transition to land, you get organisms that can now thrive in it, which is where amphibians come in. And then of course you get, you know, further advanced into reptiles and mammals and such, but we're really concerned about the amphibians. So as I mentioned earlier, the term amphibia means double life um, because one of the major characteristics of an amphibian is that they have two distinct life stages. Typically, they have an aquatic larval stage. They're born as aquatic organisms and eventually metamorphose into land organisms, right? Now, there are plenty of exceptions to that. And we actually, I would say a lot of the species in Georgia are exceptions to that, mainly our salamanders. Um, many of them don't go through what we call a complete metamorphosis. They go through something called neoteny or kind of like an incomplete metamorphosis where they either are born on land and they just stay the same way and just get larger effectively. There are also some aquatic species of salamanders that can retain their gills and basically become adults, but still remain aquatic. They don't actually become land salamanders. So really, really cool. But mostly um, the major characteristic is being able to transition from aquatic to land. They tend to have four limbs. Again, there's always exceptions. They have thin, soft, glandular skin. This is actually highly important because as we'll talk about very soon, um, amphibians do not have very good lung systems. They can't breathe on their own very well. And so the thin, soft, uh, glandular, meaning they have a lot of mucus glands, that skin allows them to absorb oxygen from their skin. So that kind of helps support their poor lung system. Speaking of the lung system, they have a three-chambered heart, which I have an image of there. So, you know, as humans, we have a four-chambered heart. You may know a lot of fish um, have even less, right? And so having a three-chambered heart is really, really convenient. As you imagine, since we have a four-chambered heart as mammals, that allows us to have a separate cycle for oxygenated blood and another cycle for deoxygenated blood. It allows them to not mix. If they start mixing, like in many species of fish, it's not very efficient to get oxygen to your bones, I mean, to your muscles. And so by having a three-chambered heart, that is what allowed amphibians to basically thrive. And if you go fishing, you might know that fish have something called an operculum, kind of like a plastic-like covering. It's not really plastic, but kind of like a covering over their gills. Um, that is what developed into the hearing apparatus um, in frogs, um, which I have a photo coming up soon of that. And they have amniotic and amniotic eggs. Basically, these are eggs that have a gel layer on top that keep them nice and moist because they still rely on water to breathe. So generally speaking, if you have most or all of these characteristics, you're probably looking at an amphibian. Basic anatomy, they tend to have similar you know, senses to we have as humans. As far as eyesight goes, it ranges. You have some species that are blind, you have some species that have night vision, like our toads, and then you have some that have selective um, color vision as well. I like to show this image because I think that herps in general have really beautiful eyes. Um, it's something you don't pay attention to because most people don't see them, but they have an, a very wide range of like eye diversity, uh, which is really, really neat to look at. Their olfaction, so their smelling senses are highly developed. This is particularly important for the salamanders um, who pretty much one of the major ways that they navigate their world is through their ability to pick up scents. You often see some salamanders have kind of like a mustache-like structure. Um, that's actually a part of their system to pick up chemicals. As for frogs, you probably know hearing is important. Um, that's why they call so much. They have a wide range of coloration, right? So some of them have camouflage coloration to blend in with their environment. Other species have what's called aposematism. That means they have poison coloration. It's bright, it's brightly colored to allow predators to know that they're poisonous. And then you have some mimicry as well of that. And they tend to have two types of glands. They have mucus glands, which keep their skin nice and moist. And then some species have paratoid glands. And the totes, that's what these big bulges are right behind their eye. 
That's where the poison's contained. So those are called paratoid glands or paratid glands. Big whole group. As you probably know, amphibians are ectothermic, which means that they get um, their, inner, their uh, heat from their environment. Now, I always, when I talk to kids about this, like to ask them, would you rather be endothermic, which means you produce your own heat, or would you rather be ectothermic, which means you get your heat from the environment? And most people tend to say endothermic, right? I wanna be able to produce my own heat. And I always push back a little bit on that because being ectothermic isn't necessarily always a bad thing. It means that you are more able to adapt to your surroundings, right? Um, you're able to be more tolerant of a wide range of conditions versus if you're endothermic, like for humans, for instance, 98.6, if we drop below that by like a couple of degrees or above that, you get sick, right? Like we have a very narrow range we have to maintain. The ectothermic species in many cases have a broader range of tolerances that they can deal with, right? But in the case of our amphibians, unfortunately, not only are they ectothermic, but they also have a small tolerance range, which impacts their lifestyle a lot. So they're not actually very tolerant of temperature changes. And so that's why they tend not to be very mobile. They tend to stay in the same place and also tend to be well hidden because they really have a narrow range of temperatures that they can survive in. As I said, especially for the lungless species, they rely almost entirely on their skin to breathe. So given all of these characteristics, you can understand why um, these species are heavily impacted across the world. And as far as habitat degradation goes, right? If they have a narrow tolerance of ranges that they can live, once you destroy their habitat, it's unlikely that they can find a new habitat quickly enough before you know, they start to die off. Um, heat changes make a big deal. Um, climate change is a big deal for them for that very reason, because they can't move very far. So if their temperature of their environment rises by two degrees, well, that's kind of it. They're not going to be able to migrate far enough to get out of that. It comes to environmental pollution as well. So if they can breathe through their skin, that means they can also take in other chemicals through their skin. So this is definitely where water quality comes in, because if there's pollutants in the water, then they're absorbing those pollutants as they're breathing through their skin. And then most importantly, if we're on the skin, I want to skip down to diseases here, because you can tell that the skin is very important for amphibian species. And there is a very bad disease impacting our amphibians now called chytrid. It's a fungus um, that basically messes with their ability to utilize their skin, um, which is kind of the worst type of disease you could probably have if you're an amphibian. And this is kind of around the world, this is spreading. Um, so it's definitely a concern that we have for amphibians. So there's kind of like your background for that. So that brings us to amphibians of Cobb County. So as I mentioned, there are three major groups of amphibians. There are frogs, there are, and this includes everything from toads to tree frogs, all of that are all in the frog category. We have salamanders, this includes mud puppies, newts, amphiumas, all of those kind of like slimy lizard-like uh, creatures are salamanders. And then we have Sicilians, which again, are not in the North America, so we're not even gonna talk about them. So when I go and list these species, it's gonna be a lot all at once, but one of the major ways that you can probably identify what species you're either looking at or hearing is by habitat. So when I go through these species, I'm going to list one of four habitats that you can find them from ephemeral wetlands. These are ponds or puddles that dry up temporarily throughout the year to permanent wetlands. So these are wetlands that have water all year round to creeks and streams. And then, of course, land, which really is mainly the toads. But there are other species as well that if you can't find a body of water for really far away, then that kind of narrows down what you're finding there because very few species can tolerate that. Also, they differ by their breeding season, their active season. So some are breeding in the spring, some in the summer, some in the fall, and some in the winter as well. So I'll also mention that too. So let's go ahead and get started and we'll start with the frogs of Cobb County. So there are generally 14 potential species you can find in Cobb. There are some species that I'm going to list here that are like kind of on the edge, like they're just above Cobb County, 
um, but they can potentially be here. Um, I kind of compiled this list of species based off of what I know is in Cobb County and based off of what people have reported and what could potentially be in Cobb County based off of the habitat. But in that 14 species, we have six species of tree frogs, we have four species of toads, and four species of what we call true frogs. So we'll start with the tree frogs. The first tree frog that we're going to talk about is the bird voice tree frog. These are more of a colder type species, so you'll start to find these in the spring and summer. Um, these, and I should say pretty much with all tree frogs, generally you're finding them in permanent wetlands. So these are areas that have water most of the time. Um, depending on the type of creek, if you're at a creek, uh, depending on how large that creek may be, they can also be around your creek as well. One of the major ways that I pretty much can tell the difference is that they're always bicolor. Um, so they always have one color on their belly and one color on the back, um, kind of like here. It's always one color here. The top, their back can kind of vary in green to yellow or brown, so I wouldn't use that as an identification. Um, but honestly, all the tree frogs are really, really small. And so the only way you're probably going to ide identify them, because you probably don't see them, is by their call. So let's go ahead and play the bird voice tree frog call. Can you all hear that? So you can see how it gets its name. It almost legit sounds just like a bird. So when you hear anything, and usually these are kind of evening, nighttime activities, so you're typically not going to hear birds during that time. And so if you're ever like out at night or in the evening and you hear like that repeated ringing, then you could be pretty confident that you're listening to a bird voice tree frog. Really cool. Let's move on to our next amphibian, our green tree frog, which a lot of people don't know is actually our state amphibian. The Georgia state amphibian is the green tree frog. Um, very easy to identify when you see it. They tend to always have like a mustache, a white kind of mustache that extends all the way to their hind end. They also sometimes have like white spots in their back. Very, very distinct species. This is also a spring, summer type of amphibian. As all tree frogs, they are going to be in areas that have permanent waters. And already mentioned, I got ahead of myself, but generally speaking, if they're green, which almost all of them are, um, they also have a stripe from like their lip all the way to their hind end and occasionally white spots in their back. You're looking at a green tree frog. They also have quite a distinctive call. They sound like ducks. So maybe like I've kind of heard people sometimes use like those hunting duck like uh, horn things. Um, they don't sound exactly like that, but pretty close. So really cool species. We also have the upland chorus frog. So these are very common in Cobb County. I hear these all the time. Um, these are typically um, more tolerant in cold weather conditions. Um, they're actually a lot of times one of the first frogs I hear in the spring, so really cool. Uh, as always, um, they like permanent wetlands. These are guys that you'll usually find, though, with a really good buffer. And so if you're removing your buffer from, like, your stream or from whatever body of water you live at, um, a lot of times you're not going to hear these chorus frogs as much. They really, really like those high grassy areas. Um, and they're a bit harder to identify. Um, one, because again, they tend to be really small, um, but if you do happen to have one in your hand, um, they all kind of have like this uh, raccoon mask kind of behind their at, behind their eyes a lot of times and also have like a white mustache. So really looking at like the front of their body as well. Let's go ahead and hear their call. People describe their call as like running your finger through a comb. It's a really, really long kind of creak sound. It's 
So nice. Yep. So very, very distinctive call. Like I said, these are at least the ones personally I hear the most here in Cobb County. Um, very common species. And you'll actually hear these throughout the day as well. Um, you're not exclusively going to be calling at night. Our next species, the spring peeper. These are definitely probably one of the tinier of all the ones. Um, you'll usually be able to see these hopping across the land. I usually see these pretty far from water sources, surprisingly. But this is another cold species. So they get their name spring peeper because they tend to be among the first collars in the spring. Um, as you can see in its scientific name, Sud Sudacris crucifer, um, they partially get that name because they all tend to have like a cross on their back. So if you see it, you kind of see like a faint kind of X on their back. So like I said, they tend to be permanent wetlands, but these are actually quite common. You'll find them pretty far away from their water body um, in my experience. Um, so if you see that distinct X on its back, its call is also very distinctive. They sound like peeps, which is where they get their common name from. So, very neat species as well. So you get the spring peeps. Sometimes you get a trill. I don't think I've ever heard the trill in real life, but sometimes you'll hear a trill right afterwards and it kind of gets confused with another species we'll talk about. But once you hear those peeps, it's pretty much it. You also have the Northern Cricket Frog, which this one's kind of weird. You can kind of hear these like at any time really, um, but typically it's a spring-ish summer species and anywhere with water, you'll find these. So they're a bit more tolerant than many of the other tree frog species of like the water that you'll find them there. They have a very distinctive call that we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but out of all the frogs, they tend to have a more of a warty appearance, which is common for toads mainly. Um, but cricket frogs can kind of have a bit of a warty appearance. Um, they also have like this triangular pattern on their forehead, um, if you can call it that. So from their eye to their snout, they tend to always have like this heart, this triangle arrowhead shape. There's another photo. So you can kind of see like this heart arrowhead like shape. Um, that's pretty common for that group as well. Their call kind of sounds like, um, if you can hear like two marbles tied to a string and then you just let them clack. That's kind of what cricket frogs sound like. And oftentimes when it comes to the cricket frogs, you don't usually hear them by themselves. They're almost always in a chorus. Um, so you'll hear lots and lots of those clicking. Um, almost sounds, some, I think some people maybe describe them as closer to maybe galloping horses, but there are other species that sound like that too. Next we have Cope's gray tree frog, which is an interesting species. That is not always gray, but this is another species we're getting into the warmer season so from spring to summer um, you'll find these in both kind of temporary wetlands and permanent wetlands but usually i believe you're going to find them more so in the permanent areas um, the coloration can vary they are not always like this they can actually have a bit more color to them but they do have flash coloration so there's another copes gray right there but if you can get your hands on one, their hind leg has a flash coloration um, that we believe is used to kind of bore away predators. Um, so that's one way you can really tell the species. That flash coloration on the hind leg is common for many other species as well. So their call is very distinct though. It's very, it, it kind of makes you jump. It's very sharp, it's very trill-like. There you go. 
So very short, trail-like. Um, usually, like, you know, they, these are ones that will sneak up on you. In my experience, like, they'll just call and then you go, what? Okay, that's a frog. So, and that covers all the tree frogs. Let's move on to what are called the true frogs. I don't know why they get that name. There's nothing specifically truer about them than the other frog, but it's just how they, the group that they got put in. But in this group, we have the largest in North America, the bullfrog, which if it's, an, if it's a mature bullfrog, you know it when you see it because those things are pretty large. Um, these are more of a warmer species. Um, and you're usually going to find them in more permanent wetlands with high amounts of vegetation. So pretty much in really ideal habitats, a lot of times you'll find them. Aside from its size, it's really hard to tell a bullfrog when you're looking at it. Um, it has very just bland coloration. Like this is just one photo, but they can kind of vary a lot uh, when they're like growing up still. And so when they're the same size as the other frog species we'll talk about, it's really hard to tell. But their call is very, very distinct. They sound like a bullfrog in my opinion. It sounds like a yawn, a very, very bassy yawn, almost more bassier than my voice, really. So that's the bullfrog, really unique species. Um, some people also say one way you can kind of tell is that their tympanum here is like much larger than their eye. I don't know if that's like a more of a confirmation ID thing, but that could also be one way to help you identify them if you ever see them. Um, they are also, despite their size, um, in my experience, these are also one of the most sensitive species in terms of like running away from you. Um, a lot of frogs you can get pretty close to um, before they get freaked out or start to run away, but bullfrogs, um, usually they'll be gone as soon as they hear the whiff of you in my experience. I mean, it's very rare that you come across one by accident. They're usually moving away or hiding underwater. Next, we have the pickerel frog. So this is another colder species. Um, these are where we start to uh, get into the frogs that you'll find more so around rivers and streams and such, uh, mostly creeks and streams. Um, they're very easy to identify. Um, at least the way that I remembered is that the term P for pickerel can also mean paired. And so they also always have like a paired row of spots, always like two, two rows of spots down their back every time. Very easy to ID. Um, as far as the rest of their colors, it can vary. But if you see those spots in a row on their back, like that's usually very easy. They also have a very snore-like call. Here we go. So very, very, a lot of people can confuse it, right, with that comb, with that comb. Oops, sorry. But this one sounds a bit more yawny, I believe, in my opinion. So very cool. So definitely this one is one that you'll be able to see a lot of times too. Um, so if you see those paired rows, um, honestly, I don't hear them calling as much, but if you see them, you can definitely tell by looking at them. Speaking of spots, next we have the leopard frog, which also has a lot of spots and can look very similar to the pickerel frog. Um, again, don't get confused by these pictures. Um, these guys can vary widely in the colors that they have. And a lot of times too, in a different state, they can start to have different patterns and colorations as well. Um, but if you see a lot of spots, um, but they're not in a row, then you might be looking at a leopard frog. Again, pickerel frogs always have paired spots. So that's obvious. And if you don't see pairs, it might be a leopard frog you're looking at. Another kind of spring-ish summer species 
Um, and these are pretty tolerant as well. So you'll find them pretty much in any water body that doesn't have fish because the fish will eat their tadpoles. Again, their coloration varies, but you're really just looking for spots at this point to find these guys. Their call kind of sounds like a laughter, kind of like a little chuckle. Very cool, at least for me personally, when I was trying to catch them back in the day, um, they were quite hard to catch. And so at least the way that I learned to identify them is because they're always laughing at you because you can never catch them. Um, so leopard frogs has the chuckle. Next, we have the green frog, which is often confused as well with the bullfrog. You can kind of tell why. Um, they all kind of have like just this muddy, dark green, dark brown appearance. Another warmer species that you can find pretty much in any body of water. Um, but their call is quite distinctive. So we'll talk about that in just a bit. They tend to have very defined uh, ridges on their back. Um, there are other species that has that as well, but they tend not to be spotless. So if we don't see any spots and really defined ridges that might help. And really, it's their call that's going to give it away. It sounds like a banjo. <laughs> yep. So uh, it's common for them to have the multiple banjo twangs, but in my experience, they just do it once, and then you have to wait like another 40 seconds but very common in Cobb County as well. I hear them a lot. Um, so if you ever hear that like just doink or that twang sound, and we'll finish off the frogs with the toads, which kind of encompass a bunch of different groups. Um, but we'll start with the Eastern Spadefoot toad. Um, very distinct eyes. So if you ever see their eyes, at least, that kind of gives it away. Um, they kind of have like a crosshair type eye, another warmer type of species. As since they're a part of the group of toads, these are ones that you can find a bit further away from water sources than the others. They also aren't as dry looking as the other toads, um, but you'll really know a spadefoot toad when you see it. Oops. One, because the eyes give it away, the crosshair eyes, but also they have this hard spade on their foot, which doesn't seem like much, but apparently is quite effective when it comes to digging. So this black um, little uh, digging um, appendage that they have on their back, if you can catch one, that is. They have a very um, nasally, it kind of sounds like they have allergies, in my opinion. They have a very, very like stuffy nasally call. Oh, that one kind of dipped. So yes, they have a very nasally kind of whiny like call. Um, for the kids, when I give this presentation, I always say they kind of sound a bit like Wario, if you know what Wario is, off of like the uh, Mario franchise. And they also apparently smell like peanut butter. I have smelt one before. Um, they do have a distinct smell. I don't know if peanut butter is how I identify that, but I think that's the general consensus. So they do have a, <laughs> a very distinct smell uh, upon them. Um, so if you ever get the chance, Next, we have the American toad. This is another very, very common species. You can pretty much find them any time of the year. That's not just like extremely cold, um, in my experience. Um, and you'll find these guys in a lot of different habitats too. Um, I assume they're very tolerant. Um, but you can tell they have lots of really warty appearance. They look really dry. They can be really small too, but I've seen some get a bit large in size. We'll talk about this one to two warts in a bit, but usually if you see them, it's obvious a lot of times, but their call is very, very distinct. 
It's just a really, really long trill. Yeah, they'll go on for a while. They have a very long, just trill vibration call. Um, it's not short at all, usually. Sometimes it'll be short, but in my experience, like you'll hear them go on for like a couple of seconds. So that's the American toad, very long, kind of high pitched trill. Now there is another toad that is very similar to the American toad that we also have called the Fowler's toad. Don't be confused by the images. Again, the Fowler's toad can look almost exactly like the American toad. They, in many cases, are very like almost identical. Um, but the major way that people identify them is by counting the warts. And so if you look at the islands of warts that they have, they're always grouped in kind of like islands of black spots. When it comes to American toads, they always have one to two warts per island. So you can see the max amount of warts you'll see is two or one, and they're usually really large. When you're looking at the Fowler's toad, if you look at the islands, you'll see you can have four, you'll have three, sometimes I'll owe even more than that. And so if they're really, really warty in those islands, um, that's usually common for the Fowler's toad. Outside of that, um, it's kind of a free, free ball there, um, but they also pretty can be found at any time of the year too. Any type of habitat as long as there's water somewhere in the periphery. Um, and again, three plus warts. Their call is also very similar to the American to toad as well. Fowler's. So they're a bit shorter. I don't know if that's necessarily, that might just be like this audio call just plays them shorter. But the way I usually try to discern the difference is that when you're talking about the American toad, there's a lot more vibration. It's not very smooth in the call. I'll play the American toad again. So you can at least hear the vibration. There's a bit more rumble in them. Whereas the Fowler's toad is a bit smoother and call. Although to be fair, um, that might just be a regional thing too. So if you go to like, you know, another state, um, they might have a bit more vibration, it's a bit more difficult. And we'll finish off here with the Eastern narrow mouth toad. Another toad you can find in any place. They're all pretty common. The habitats remain the same. But they are very distinct. <laughs> From their name, you can tell they always have a very just like abrupt end to their face. It's always kind of like stuffed at the little tip here, um, hence the narrow mouth. They're very, very distinct and they're super, super small. Um, this photo kind of uh, makes them seem larger than they are, but they can like pretty much fit on your index a lot of times. They're very, very small. <laughs> super annoying. Sometimes these frog calls can be a bit much when you hear too many at once. So you can kind of hear the trend in like just longer calls. Um, and it's really just the nature, the, the kind of the texture of the call. But that covers the amphibians. So now we're going to go into the salamanders. So we're going to kind of zoom a bit further, quicker through the salamanders, one, because we're in a long time, but also the salamanders are insanely difficult compared to the frogs to identify. There are some that are obvious, but many of them, especially if they're not mature, can almost look the same. It is very hard. I mean, in many cases, I miss ID a lot of these as well, um, just because it's really hard to tell these uh, specific features, unless you're literally like a scientist that studies them for a living. 
But generally, there are about 14 potential species that you could find. We have three mole salamanders. These are the obvious ones. So you'll definitely be able to ID these. We have one newt species, the red spotted newt, also very obvious. And then we have 14 lugless salamanders, which these are the ones that get a bit more difficult to identify. So let's start with the mole salamanders. We'll start with the marble salamander we have here. Very distinct coloration. It's has that marble coloration that you'd expect. Um, they're also really chunky. Um, they are, they're kind of like the football players of the salamander world. They're large, they can fit on your hand. They're very, very obvious. And surprisingly, what's common about these species is that they're usually found on hills. I don't know if that's like where they're always found, but a lot of times you find them on hills. I don't know what that relationship is, but underneath rocks and logs of hills is usually where you'll find these uh, marble salamanders. The coloration is pretty distinct. They also have poison glands in their tail, so they shouldn't be eaten from the back end. The spotted salamander, or some people call them the yellow spotted salamander, um, pretty distinct. They always have yellow spots. They're also pretty big and chunky as well. These are kind of a spring-ish cold species, actually around now. I'd imagine the next big rain we have, um, they'll probably be out breeding. So if you live near a pond, um, usually ephemeral pond, not a permanent pond, if you live near a pond right after the next rain, or even during the next rain towards the tail end of it, you should go check it um, because you might find them breeding, which would be really cool. The two rows of yellow spots isn't always common, but they always have yellow spots. And then you have what is just the mole salamander. Uh, the mole salamander is just bland. Um, it's, if they're juveniles, it's kind of hard to know they are mole salamanders in many cases, but they tend to be, again, a bit on the larger end, have a lot more meat to them, a bit of a colder species, and they kind of vary on where you'll find them, but typically around some type of ephemeral pond. And really the major way you ident identify them is just knowing that they're not the other species, like the yellow spotted or the um, or the, uh, the blue or the uh, marble salamander. Moving on to the newts, we have one, the red spotted newt, very common species. You can kind of find them at any time, really. Um, and it's kind of a, a gem when you find them, too, because they appear out of nowhere. Um, they're pretty tolerant a lot of times. Um, you most commonly will find them like near bogs and such. And they have this odd relationship with, um, with kind of sphagnum moss. Um, but you can really find them a lot anywhere. They're very dry looking. They don't tend to be as slimy. They also tend to have the red spots on their back. It's a very distinctive species. And they also have like the yellow eyelid kind of structure to in their eyes, which you know when you see them. These are poisonous. And then let's go ahead and just zoom through the salamanders as well. So we have mud salamanders um, because they tend to have a mud appearance. These are more of a colder species. And for all of these salamanders, um, when it comes to the lungless salamanders, um, they're usually found um, what, near creeks and streams. If you know anything about like stream physiology, um, streams have a lot more oxygen in them than like ponds and such and stagnant waters. And since these are all lungless salamanders, they need a lot more oxygen. So usually you're only gonna find them at running waters like creeks and streams. Not really going to go too much through the characteristics, except for the ones I know. Um, but moving on to the red salamander, another cooler species. It's also common to find a lot of these in the fall. Creeks and streams are where you'll find them. Um, they also have yellow eyes. If you can see their eyes, but usually you can't see their eyes because they're so small. Um, they're pretty large compared to many other stream salamanders, too. Slimy salamanders are among our common, most common salamanders. They're often confused with yellow spotted or just a spotted salamander. Um, but the main difference is like these guys are really skinny. 
Like if you had a spotted next to each other and a slimy, there is a very distinct difference in the amount of meat they have. These are always really slender, almost like snake-like in their structure. Typically, you'll also find these kind of like in the fall region too. So if you ever see kind of like a dark coloration and a bunch of yellow spots, um, you're probably looking at a slimy. Reds, uh, the red-back salamander is one of our most common salamander species. They all have this red stripe along their back. Very distinct group. So if you ever see, you usually only see their tail a lot of times because they're halfway underground, but they always have that, that black body with the red stripe on their back. And you can find them almost anywhere, quite far away from many water sources too. Um, as long as it's moist, they will be there because they lay their eggs actually underneath logs. So this is more of a terrestrial salamander, a land salamander. You also have the four-toed salamander, another distinct one. Uh, they have a very flat, blocky snout. Um, their color can range, but they always on their belly, which I don't have a photo of, but on their belly, it looks like a marbled salamander. They always have a marbled belly with like spots on it. Um, very distinct. Most of the other salamanders are pretty uniform on top and bottom. Um, but so if you ever see a flat face and then you flip it over and its belly, it just has like this marbled color with like a bunch of black spots. Very distinct. You also find these guys in lots of bogs too. You have the spring salamander. Another one that's pretty difficult to identify unless it's really mature. But when it gets to the muds and the reds and the springs, you really just have to have an expert help you out. Um, when they're mature, sometimes you'll see like this distinct face pattern. You have the seal salamander, another kind of difficult species to identify. Um, this is just one photo, but I can literally show you dozens and they look very different. Um, so I'm not gonna talk too much about that. But the three line salamanders are very distinct. They have three black lines, one down the middle of their back and two down the side, as you can see in this photo here. And they look like this when they're larvals, when at their larval stage as well. So you can almost tell a three line versus a two line always, because they usually develop those lines pretty quick in their life. Nothing. You can kind of find these towards the summer too, I believe. The two-line salamander is different from the three-lined because it doesn't have the central stripe down the back. It only has two lines on its side, and then usually on its center of the back, it has a bunch of black spots. Also pretty distinct. You can tell when they're at their larval stages too. They always had these little spots and two lines down the side. These are pretty common in Cobb County too, the two-lined and the three-lined. And we'll finish off with the dusky salamander, um, which is often confused with the mole salamander um, when they're at their larval stages. And quite frankly, if the mole salamander isn't very developed yet, if it's still young, it can look very close to a spotted dusky salamander. Um, but generally, duskies tend to be really small, really slender, and have just that, that really muddy, earthy type of color to them. Awesome. And that covers all of Cobb County's amphibians that you could potentially find. So hopefully you all learned something um, about maybe you've even heard these species. I know for a fact some of them are already calling. Um, so hopefully now when you go outside, you'll get to hear them. If you have more of a deeper interest in these guys, we actually have a community um, volunteer amphibian monitoring program. Um, you can just go to our website, cobstreams.org, and look under our, our volunteer tab to see that, um, to get more information on that. Um, but I highly recommend you participate in that as well. Um, it's pretty low commitment. Um, there's two types of ways you can commit. There's a low commitment version and a high commitment version. So um, we'd love to have you a part of that program if you're interested. Um, all of these calls are also available on that same web page for our amphibian monitoring program. So if you just want to have those audio calls, you can download them from that web page. 
um, copstreams.org and just look for the amphibian monitoring program. It's really cool. So on that note, thank you all so much for tuning in. Feel free to email me if you have any questions about anything I talked about or want more information. And I will see you all hopefully at our next Lunch and Learn. Have a good one. Thank you.